I want to build just a foundation on what will be happening as we go forward. And it's my prayer as we talk about church and politics. I want to remind us that the biggest responsibility you have as a child of God, number one, is to have your voting card and also be ready to vote. That is very, very important because if you miss that, you're missing something very, very important. You know, sometimes people say, I don't care who comes into leadership. I don't care who leads. But the truth of the matter, whoever comes into leadership, whatever happens will affect all of us, whether you voted or you did not vote. And as I was preparing and asking God, what can I come and share with the people of God today? This message came to me that I'll be sharing with you. But before that, I want to give just a summary on the focus of our book because there's a perspective you have been given in our book that is very, very critical for us to lay down. Then I'll share with you what the Lord has been speaking to me and has placed in my heart, even as a nation, as a people, as we look forward, not just August, even as we move forward as a nation, there are certain things that are very, very critical. But before that, I want just to give a brief introduction to the study you are going to use because it is important to just give that, that skeleton kind of an introduction, which I believe will be very, very important. The question is still one. Where is the voice of the church? Why is the church voiceless? That's a question that is all over. And if you look at the number of Christians that are Christians, statistics say that we are 80% Christians. But sometimes you ask yourself, where is the voice of the church? And many a times you hear people who are not born again ask, where is the church? Or even we Christians sometimes ask, what is the church doing? Because the church is there specifically for a particular responsibility that we'll be sharing as we move forward. And... Um, because of that, the leadership came up with this powerful manual. And there are four things that will be reminding you at all as a Christian that the society is in need of guidance. The society needs to be guided. And there's nobody who can guide the society apart from you as a child of God. And secondly, that from their knowledge of either the Bible or our history or both, People know that the church should offer some guidance concerning the issues that confound society. In other words, people believe outside there that when things are going bad, the church should do something. And that's a very important thing. Another thing we are reminded is that they are not hearing the voice of the church in a satisfactory manner. These are people who are speaking outside there. When families are breaking, when politicians are differing, when institutions are failing, people ask, where is the voice of the church? Where are those Christians who can bring sobriety in such a situation? So they are saying they are not hearing the voice of the church in a satisfactory manner because they believe the church has a bigger mandate or being the light and the salt of the world. So when things go wrong, people ask, where is the church? We are not satisfied with what we are seeing. And also people outside there always ask, when it is asked by us Christian, as is often the case, the question reflects a view that influencing the politics of the land is a preserve and duty of the top church leaders and not the individual Christians on the ground you'll find there's that misconception that if this nation is going to be at peace, we only need a few people, maybe pastors and intercessors in church, to come and pray for the nation. We forget to understand that any child of God who is called of the Lord has a responsibility, and I'll be showing you from the scripture, because if we miss this as children of God, when things go wayward, we cannot blame anybody 
Because any child of God who is called of God and born again must understand what God wants from us. And uh, during this season of May, June, we'll be asking ourselves two questions. What would God want us to do about our politics? Very, very important. I don't need to go in definition of what politics is or even church is because that is something you can get the meaning very clearly from the dictionary and, and, and just from the, the books that we have. We'll also be asking ourselves, how do we ensure that we act obediently and do that which God has called us to do? Because that is something that is of great, great importance. And I pray this morning that as I bring this message to us, that God will speak to every last one of us because God is counting on you. God is counting on me. God is counting on our children. God is counting on our teenagers. Because if the church will continue to be silent, then I tell you we are missing something very, very big. I was telling those who are here on Wednesday, that a closed mouth is a closed destiny. When you close your mouth, you're closing your destiny. And uh, we'll be looking from the scripture, what is in the heart of God? And what is God telling us to do as believers? Allow me to read uh, briefly with us the book of Psalms 96. Psalms 96, then I'll build... On that, then pray together with us in Jesus' name. Psalms 96. The Bible says this beautiful word. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the all earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he has done. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all other gods. The gods of other nations are mere idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Number six, by the six. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and beauty fill his sanctuary. All nations, the world recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserved. Bring your offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. Tell all the nations the Lord reigns. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. He will judge all peoples fairly. Verses 11. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the fields and the crops burst out with joy. Let the trees of the forest rustle with praise. Before the Lord, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with justice and the nations with his truth. Father God, I thank you. Bless you for this word. As I speak to myself and to this congregation, Lord, I pray that you'll speak to every last one of us. Thank you for this opportunity. Just to bring your word to your people. Bless you and worship you, Jehovah God. In Jesus' name, I have prayed. Amen. The question I'm asking this morning, why is the church voiceless? That's a very contradicting statement. Some people can say the church is not voiceless. The church voice is clear. We hear that clear prophetic voice. But the truth of the matter, it is seen that the church is voiceless. And we want to ask ourselves, why is the church voiceless? From the book I've just read, we are seeing three powerful things. 
that can give us some perspective as we deal with this subject I'm talking about this morning. Number one, the earth is to praise his majesty. From verses one to six, the Bible is saying the earth is to praise his majesty. God is great than all goods and gods you can mention. Other gods are just idols. He made everything and is therefore superior to everything you can think about. So we are seeing the earth is to praise his majesty. We are told his sanctuary is full of splendor, majesty, strength, and glory. When you come to the house, the sanctuary of God, you see splendor, you see glory, you see strength, and you see majesty. That is a God who needs to be praised. So as we look at this portion of bread, the Bible is calling the earth, not men, not women, not even human beings. The earth is to praise his majesty. No wonder in the entire book, you are seeing human beings are to praise the Lord. Animals are to praise the Lord. Crops, animals should rejoice because of who God is. The second thing that we see from verses 7 to 10, the nation must recognize that God reigns. Somebody say amen. Our God reigns. Sometimes we sing God reigns, but the truth of the matter is that our God reigns. And because our God reigns, we need to ask ourselves, what does God expect of us as his children? Because that is very, very important. And looking at verses 7, 8, 9, and 10, the Bible says, all nations of the world, recognize the Lord. And I want to tell us this morning, Sita Meldoret, let us recognize the Lord because our Lord reigns. The Bible says, recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. We don't have any other God who is glorious and strong as our God. And that's why when church realizes this, we are not going to be silent, but we are going to open our mouth. Somebody say amen. The Bible says, these people sang a new song. You know this, something that is very dangerous, that as a Christian, you remain singing the old song. When God has manifested himself to you, you are still singing your old song. The Bible says, sing to him a new song. And I'll be explaining that in a short while. And number three that I'm seeing in the book of Psalms is that uh, from verses 8 to 13, all nature should rejoice. Our vegetation, our land, everything that we have, our animals should rejoice, not because of anything, but because our God is reigning in the nation. Somebody say amen. You know, the original blueprint of God for the church is that God wanted the church to be the light and the salt of the world. That was the original blueprint. And it still stands even today that we are supposed to be the light and the salt of the world. We are supposed to radiate the glory of God. I was just reminding myself about this theme. We are in the month of May. And I was asking myself as Pastor Ibrahim, am I, am I really radiating the glory that God wants me to radiate? And if I'm not radiating, what is causing me not to radiate the glory of God? Because in the mind of God, God wants us to radiate his glory. He wants us to be the light and the salt of the world. Where there is tribalism, you bring brotherly love. Where there is stereotyping, you bring the originality of the person you're trying to stereotype because we are all made in the image of God. We are wonderfully and fearfully made by him, God. So every time you understand the mind of God, you are saying, God, I just want to do what is right. Listen to me, somebody. We cannot have a voice when we Christian sing the same songs that we have been singing for a long time. When we are dancing. The dances that the world is dancing. We cannot be a voice. And I want to challenge us in Jesus name. On Wednesday by the grace of God. God impressed a word in my heart. 
about the place of repentance if we are going to become a voice in this dispensation. And as we look at repentance as the gateway to shalom, I want you to understand one thing, that God is calling you and me to know our place. Because if we are going to radiate the glory of God, we need to understand what is in the mind of God and what is that that God expects from us. We need to experience the peace of God. It is yesterday we were in our ADC and one of the members, one of the delegates was saying, we need to pray so much for families. And he was crying and saying, what is being done for families? We need to pray. Things are tough. Things are hard. Men and women are going through a lot of things. But I came to realize, child of God, that there's something God is calling every child of God to do. And if we do it rightly, then we'll be a voice to reckon. Somebody say amen. Repentance is the gateway to shalom. Repentance is a gateway to peace. Whether in a family setup, whether in a church setup, whether in a national setup, repentance is a gateway to shalom. When Christians don't know the place of repentance, will not have an impact on this fallen world. Will not have a say on this fallen world. And that's why it is very, very important, the child of God, even as we hear from the mind of God, that we need to come to a place of saying, God, help us to understand you. Peace is what we all need. In a nation like this, what we need is peace. In your family, relationship between husband and wife, what you all need is peace. But any time there is something that goes wayward, because politics in simple definition, are activities that are geared towards some improvement of life here and there, either at the family level, at a community level, at a society level. That is what we call politics because many times we, we have taken politics as campaign and other things. That is just the climax of what needs to be done. But politics where people come and reason together and say, how can we empower our people? How can our families be better and all those kind of things? And when it is done rightly, then God also glorifies himself. So I want to challenge us children of God. Because I'm saying repentance is the gateway to shalom. I might be talking to you this morning, but you are not experiencing peace at all. Leave alone the election in August. Whatever outcome will come. But maybe you as an individual, that peace is not there. You are not enjoying the shalom from God. That you can no longer pray. You can no longer read the word of God. You can no longer go to fellowship. And this call you as a child of God because you are supposed to be the voice of God. In your family, when things are not working, you are supposed to be the voice of the Lord and declare things and say, this is what God is saying. And that's why you should ask yourself, when we talk about repentance as a gateway to shalom, what is repentance in a simple word? I want to give you some foundational understanding just briefly because of my time. When we talk about repentance, repentance is a mourning over one sin with corresponding action to change one's action. That is repentance. You are mourning and you are saying, God, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon my family. Have mercy upon my children. Have mercy upon my community. And you are saying, I want to act in this particular way. That is repentance because when you repent, something happened in the heavenlies. Number two, meaning of repentance is that it's thinking, arriving at a new understanding and adjusting attitudes and actions. You, 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 you adjust your attitudes. You adjust your action as a child of God. Because what is killing Kenya is our attitudes and our actions. 
That's what is killing us. Nothing more than that. But if people can allow their mind to, to be renewed, their mind to be changed, I tell you things will be different. And this is not possible until you reach a place of saying, God, I want to turn around. I want to begin thinking differently. I want to have a new understanding. Why is this happening to my family? Why is this happening to my community? Why is this happening to my nation? And as you begin having a rethinking, you call yourself to a boardroom meeting and say, why am I acting the way I'm acting? Why am I behaving the way I'm behaving? The moment you can rethink and answer that question, you are going to a direction that God wants you to go. Somebody say amen. Number two, mean, number three meaning of repentance is a realignment with the principles and purposes of God where God's people or the world has become misaligned as with a blind line. They have become misaligned us with a plumb line. I was uh, sharing from this book recently, Amos chapter 7 and verses 7 to 8. The Bible says, Then he showed me another vision. I saw the Lord standing beside the wall that had been built using a plumb line. He was using a plumb line to see if it was straight. Can you ask your neighbor, are you straight? Because God is using a plumb line. And the man of God is saying, I saw the Lord standing before the wall that had been built using a plumb line. He was using a plumb line to see if it was straight. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And Amos answered, I see a plumb line. And the Lord replied, I will test my people with this plumb line. I will no longer ignore all their sins. Listen to me, somebody, in the name of Jesus Christ. We serve a very powerful God. That's why I began by saying our God reigns. We need to praise his majesty. All the nature should glorify his name. Our God reigns. And every time God comes to look at our life, when God comes with his plumb line, wanting to look at how straight we are in our life, are we going to be found straight as children of God? Because as Christians, if we miss that test, then we are going to be voiceless. Because there's nothing we'll tell people. There's nothing we'll explain to people. Because already our life is crooked. Our way of thinking is crooked. Our behavior is crooked. So there's nothing we can tell anybody. And that's why God is saying, I will test my people with this plumb line. He will come and test us. And that's why repentance is very, very key. When God is putting his plumb line, when he finds your life not straight, the only option you have is to go to him in mourning, to go to him in rethinking again and tell God, just come and have mercy upon me. And as you do that as a child of God, God is going to bless you. Somebody say amen. Repentance is a calling back to the covenant God has with his people, often by the prophet. He's calling us back. He's saying, come back, my children. You are the light and the, uh, and the salt of the world. There's this scripture that we like quoting so much, a very nice scripture, particularly in a political season like this. We like quoting 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 14. That is just a scripture on repentance, calling us back to the purposes and the covenant of God. The Bible says, Then if my people who are called by my name, Church, are we together? If my people, not politicians, not engineers, not doctors, but the Bible is saying, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. You know, we are praying for restoration in the land. That's why the book I read 
Even the plants and the animals were rejoicing. People were singing a new song because the God who reigns had taken over. And when God takes over, things don't remain the same. Somebody say amen. God is calling you and me this morning. If there's anything you can do, as we talk about church and politics, is to take your place as a cold one out and know that you are a Christian. And that's why when we come to a church like Sitam here, we don't put our crowns. I know I'm talking to very powerful people here. But when you come here, you put your crown down. You can kneel before the Lord. You can call on the name of the Lord. When we call for Acacia to pray for the nation, when we call for meetings to just intercede for families, because you know you are called one out, you'll say, God, for the sake of restoration in families, for the sake of restoration in, 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 in the nation, God, I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to pray. And as you pray and seek the face of the Lord, the Bible is very, very clear that something will happen. Somebody say amen. But there's that thing word. And turn from your wicked ways. Why is the church voiceless? You know you can humble yourself. You can pray. You can seek the face of the Lord. But if you don't turn from your wicked ways, you'll still be voiceless. God wants to use me to be that voice that can bring reason where people are confused. To be that voice that can bring direction where people are direct, don't have direction. That's what I'm saying this morning. So the Bible is saying we need to understand the place of repentance as children of God. You know, as we talk about repentance, repentance is part of the gospel. There is no way you can complete the gospel without repentance. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus in the book of John chapter 3 verses 3. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. We all want to see the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is here with us. But we cannot see the kingdom of God unless we are born again. Jesus himself proclaimed the same. And Jesus said that promise is here with us at last. Turn away from your sins and repent and see what God can do. I'm just paraphrasing that portion of the scripture in the book of Mark chapter 1 verses 15. And the man of God, Peter, when he was preaching, he told people, repent, 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 and see the results of your repentance because the Holy Spirit will come upon you, not just you alone, but to your children, and even to the Gentiles, the Holy Ghost will come upon them. So repentance is a part of the gospel. And I want to challenge us this morning. There is no way we can preach this gospel if we have not changed certain things in our lives. Because repentance simply means you are choosing to change something. You are choosing to change that attitude of stereotyping. You are choosing to change that attitude you have to a particular people, to a particular community, to a particular place. You are changing that. That is what repentance is all about. And when we do it correctly, I strongly believe that God is going to bless us. If you agree with me, say amen. Children of God, there is a need for repentance. Thank God for our church leadership thinking of church and politics. But I want to say this. I know our children are here. Teenagers are here. Young people are here. There is that need for repentance. Because if we don't do that, we'll be going round the circles. Round the circles. But I want to say this. When an individual or group goes their own way apart from God's way, we need repentance. When people begin doing their own things, God is not in the picture. God is not in the center. We need revival. When we sin and fall short of the glory of God, we need revival. Because God expects us to radiate his glory. And we cannot radiate the glory of God as we continue living in sin. 
When we understand our spiritual blindness and how we need that flesh illumination from the Lord, we, we will cry for revival. We say, God, just revive me once more time. God, revive me once more time. You know, we have reached a place where we are content. Even with the election that is coming, we are very content. We are not seeking the face of the Lord. Things are just normal. Things are okay. We only have two months to come or three, but things are just okay. But God is still asking, where is the voice of the church? People can pray. People can seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways and say, God, this is the direction the church is taking in the spiritual arena because anything that affects the spiritual realm also affects the physical realm. Somebody say amen. You know, if all Christians decide to align themselves with the purposes of God and do the mind of God, I tell you, when they pray, something automatically will have to happen. Tuko pamoja hapo sasa watu wa Mungu. Are we together? What is the wisdom in repentance? Because maybe you're asking me, Pastor, why should I repent, a big man like me? Why should I go crying before God like a child? Why should I just go and lie down on the ground crying as a child? There is wisdom in repentance. Every time the church of Christ goes into repentance, something happens. Number one, we recognize our need. Without God, we cannot do anything. Without God, our families cannot stand. Without God, even the jobs we have cannot withstand certain challenges. But when we go to the Lord and tell him, God, I'm changing certain things, you are recognizing your need. When we go to God in repentance, we confess our sins and begin agreeing to what is in the mind of God. We mourn for our sin. That is wisdom. When we come to a congregation like this, of men and women, full of wisdom, we begin mourning and calling on the name of the Lord. I tell you, things will not remain the same. I was reading the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verses number 10. Allow me to read this briefly to us in the name of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verses number 10. And listen to these wordings keenly. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow which lacks repentance results in spiritual death. When we sorrow just for the sake of sorrowing, if that is a, a good English, then that will lead to spiritual death. But the Bible says, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience, leads us away from sin and results in salvation. In other words, when you truly repent, thank God, God is a God of a second chance. Somebody say amen. We serve a God of a second chance. It doesn't matter what you've done. But if you realize and say, God, I'm coming back like the prodigal son. And say, I know my mandate. I know my calling. I know my prophetic mandate as a child of God. And you say, I'm going back to the father. The father's arm is always open. He's waiting for you to make that decision. And just say, God, I'm just nobody. But just take me as your child. And when you allow God to take you, things begin going in a different way. Somebody say amen. I'm talking to somebody who was supposed to be a voice of reason. But because of the life you're living, things are moving from bad to worse. Because you're just there, people know you are born again, you are a Christian, you go to sit down, but your mouth is closed. You can't pray for that situation, you can't pray for that issue, and things are happening. 
So I'm saying there's wisdom in repentance. When you repent, you embrace the forgiving work of Christ for forgiveness. Because there's no way you can see God unless you're born again. You must come to Jesus and tell him, Lord, I've been living a life of sin. I've been living a double life. Come and cleanse me. Forgiveness or repentance helps you examine the relationship between our thinking and the behaviors in the situation. You know, in our makeup, there's the way we think and there's the way we behave. And a child of God who has known the wisdom in repentance will also want most of the time to examine his relationship with what is happening around him. You will think fast, and also there's a way you are going to act because of the rethinking, the re-examination that you are doing. Wisdom and repentance align our thinking with God's thinking. We begin thinking the way God wants us to think. I've been saying if Christians could be Christians and truly Christians, there are certain things that cannot happen to a beautiful nation like Kenya to a beautiful land like Kenya, to a beautiful city like Eldoret. If people who are called by the name of the Lord can align their thinking with what God is thinking. Because the Bible says God reigns. We want to see him reign in Eldoret. We want to see him reign in our families. We want to see him reign in the lives of our children. But this is not possible until you get the wisdom in repentance. Somebody say amen. I challenge you this morning. With all humility, because we keep seeking the face of the Lord, if we are going to remain relevant, if we are going to be the voice of the reason, in this dispensation we are living in, as the church, as the called one out, as those who are called by the name of the Lord, then we should know the place of repentance. And that's why a serious Christian, you cannot finish one full year even without seeking God in prayer and fasting. One full week, no Bible, no prayer. You're just busy with your daily, daily, daily work. That talks of volume. That you only pray the few minutes you're given in church and that is done. I challenge us this morning, with all humility, that God is calling us to understand the place of repentance in transformation of nations in transformation of families. When people know the place of repentance, the place of mourning, the place of realigning ourselves, the place of rethinking, something powerful will happen. Somebody say amen. I finish with this, the benefits of repentance. Why is repentance important? Anytime a child of God goes into serious repentance, there is always clear a vision of Jesus. You see Jesus clearly. You are not just seeing Jesus of that church. You are not just seeing Jesus of that family. You begin seeing Jesus clearly. In other words, you will have a clear perspective in what is happening around your life. Another benefit is that it removes a lot of fear. Many people fear serving, even in the house of God. Because there are some baggages they are still carrying. But you know the moment you repent and you, you know that Jesus has forgiven you your sins. I tell you, you'll find that your, that shame has been put down. There's another glory you'll find and God is going to bless you. So I challenge you today in the name of Jesus Christ. If you want to remove fear, because you need to be a voice in this season. In this time, when things are not going right, in the political arena, in families, in, amongst our children, you need to be a voice of reason. But this cannot happen unless you know what repentance can do in your life. It removes fear. Somebody say amen. You know, there are people who have been coming to church for the last few years, but if you give them a microphone and tell them to pray, it will be a big tussle. And that speaks of volume. 
Because if truly you're a child of God who have been walking with the Lord, who knows that God has forgiven my sins and I'm living a right life with God, you will not have any fear because already fear has been removed from you. Somebody say amen. God gives you a new pair of lips. In other words, when you repent, God cleanses your lips again and gives you a new pair of lips. That lips should be used to prophesy. That lips should be used to declare the goodness of God. That lips should be used to speak good things in the land. That's what God is saying. Because this mouth that we have was given by God for us to use it to sing a new song to him. We sing songs that bring glory to his name. That's why God gives us new pair of lips. In the Psalm 96 where I just read, the Bible is saying now sing a new song to the Lord. Sing a new song to the King of Kings because of what he has done for you. When God has blessed you, when God has uplifted you, and you know God has uplifted you after seeking his face, you'll come before him and just praise him. Somebody say amen. There is peace and strength when we repent. When people repent, there is peace and strength. Maybe I'm talking to somebody this morning. You don't have peace. There is no strength completely. You're saying, I don't know what is happening in my life, pastor. I don't understand. But when you go to God in repentance, God renews your strength. You are almost giving up. You are saying, that church, Mambayangu na church in Asia. The issue of Christianity, it's a gone story. But the moment you repent, God gives you a peace that you cannot even imagine. And he gives you strength. And you say, Kumbe, I can still move on to the glory and honor of God. Somebody say amen. There's always a heart of gladness when people repent. When we repent, there's always a heart of gladness. There's that joy that comes. You'll find the vegetation rejoicing. People are rejoicing because somebody in Sitam Eloret took his position. Somebody in men's fellowship or women's fellowship or youth fellowship took their position and said it will not be business as usual. I want to turn around and begin putting things in their right position. And by doing that, you'll find people rejoicing, nations rejoicing. Family rejoicing because of what God is able to do. Somebody say amen. 